Hey everyone, welcome to the first lesson on the CompTIA Network Plus course. Now, just in case you did not watch the intro video to this course, I will be covering the N10 008 version of this course. At the time of the making of this video, that was the latest version, which was released on the 15th of September 2021. Now, as you guys can see, the title to today's lesson is Compare and Contrast Aussie Model Layers. So, this lesson is going to be just about the Aussie model, in case you're wondering. Everything in the Duke Plus course pretty much builds on top of the Aussie model. So you need to know what it is, what the layers is, and how it actually works. All right, folks, so let's get started with the Aussie model. Now, as I've just mentioned to you guys briefly, there's seven layers in the Aussie model you guys need to be aware of. The first layer we have here for you guys is the application layer followed by presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and lastly, physical. And even though that is how I've presented them to you guys, that is actually the incorrect order, believe it or not. So normally, we work our way from the bottom to the top. So the bottom one there being physical is actually layer one. So there we have it, layer one. Data link directly above it is actually layer two. And a network is layer three, transport obviously being four, session being five, presentation being six, and then lastly, application being seven. Now, just in case you guys don't know, the other model actually stands for Open Systems Interconnection. So Aussie is actually an abbreviation for Open Systems Interconnection. That is not a question I've seen in the Network Plus exam. It does not mean that CompTIA will not ask it in the exam. I'm simply stating that it's not a question that I've seen in the exam. So, but it does help to know all the abbreviations in the Network Plus manual. So what I would encourage you guys to go and do with regards to the Network Plus course, not just with regards to the Aussie model, is if you happen to have a Network Plus manual, whether it be a physical manual or a digital manual, go through that manual and look for any abbreviations you guys can find, not just the word Aussie. If you find an abbreviation and you know what it means, for example, if you see the word L-A-N being a LAN and you know it means local area network, then skip it. But any abbreviation you find in your manual or in your findings, you know, if you go online onto YouTube or any platform, wherever you go, any abbreviation you might find that's related to Network Plus course, but you don't know the meaning of by heart. Write it down and memorize it. So I actually want to go as far as to say is to write them down on a piece of paper and to put it on maybe your wall, your fridge, any place that you can see it very regularly. So make sure you memorize those abbreviations and let them off by heart because in the Network Plus exam, a lot of questions, they will ask you the abbreviation version of a certain word. And if you don't know what the abbreviation stands for, it might just possibly confuse you in the exam. It's not a deal breaker, but it is going to make your life easier in the exam if you know the abbreviations. Now, as for the seven layers you guys see in front of you, these are the different layers that everything in the Plus course works upon. And believe it or not, this Aussie model layer is not just used for Network Plus. This is used for pretty much everything in IT. Now, how we can summarize the Aussie model is the Aussie model is a way to describe how traffic is moving from one part of the network to another. So this Aussie model or OSI model, as some people seem to call it, is just basically a guide or guideline as to how traffic moves and flows on the network and through the devices. The easy way for you guys to memorize the OSI model layers with regards to their names is to use a monomic, please do not throw salami pizza away. You'll notice that the first initial of each word corresponds to the first initial of each layer. For example, if you look at the word please, the P corresponds to the P in the physical layer being layer one. The D in the second word being do corresponds with the D in the second layer being the data link layer. And so it goes on. You'll see there are actually many little mottos or monomics online that you can go and use to help you remember the seven layers of the OSI model. 
and also to help you remember in which order the seven layers actually go. Okay folks, so let's discuss each of these seven layers individually. So I think let's start with the first layer being the physical layer. So like the name suggests, this is basically about the physical part of the network, but it's also about the signaling. This includes, but is not limited to things like your network cables, fiber cables, and the actual ability to signal from one part of the network to another. So when you find yourself troubleshooting a networking related problem, you'll notice often we tend to first start at layer one, being the physical layer, and we'll normally check basic things, like if the network cables are plugged in, or if they're plugged in properly at least, because sometimes they look like they're plugged in and they just were not seated in properly. We'll normally also check things like the punch down connections, which you'll find in your network wall boxes, or behind your patch panels. And for those of you that don't know what a wall box is, that's the little white box that you'll find at most people's desks or little workstations. So it's got a network cable coming in from the server room or the network cabinet. And that network cable goes into the little wall box. And in the little wall box is like an RJ45 network port, which allows you to go and plug a small little fly lead. In other words, a small little short network cable from there to your laptop or your desktop or your VoIP phone in most cases. So the next time you hear someone say there's a layer one or a physical layer problem, they are for the most part talking about things like we just mentioned. Other possible tests you guys can go and do in the layer one category is things like running loopback tests. This is when you test the network card of the device by having it ping itself. You can do this by going into command prompt and typing in, for example, ping space 127.0.0.1 and then waiting for well hopefully for replies you can also maybe replace some network cables besides making sure they're plugged in properly so sometimes it was plugged in properly and everything was hunky-dory it's just the cable itself is faulty because maybe someone took an office chair and drove over the cable and something inside of it broke it does happen that's one of the reasons why we've got wall boxes at the workstations because then, at least, you don't have to replace the whole network cable. You just need to replace the short little fly lead from the wall box to your workstation. And that's normally somewhere around 1 meter to about 3 or 4 meters if you're using the metric system. So, yeah, if it doesn't work, maybe try replacing the network cable. If that solves the problem, at least then you know it was the network cable. Okay, so what have we learned so far about the physical layer being layer 1? The physical layer is responsible for the actual transmission and receipt of the signals that represent bits of data from one node to another node. And in case you don't know, this can be done via either cable or wireless. The physical layer also specifies the following, the physical network topology and the physical interface. These topics will all be covered in much more depth later on the course for those of you that don't know what these things are yet. So no worries guys, as the saying goes, Hakuna Matata. Now the next layer of the OSI model is obviously layer 2, which is the data link layer. The data link layer is basically a foundation layer for the protocols that will begin to stack on top of layer 2. At the data link layer, a segment is one where all nodes can send traffic to one another using hardware addresses, regardless of whether they share access to the same media. The hardware addresses is sometimes referred to as a layer 2 address, which is things like your media access control addresses, or just MAC address for short. A layer 2 segment might include multiple physical segments. This is referred to as a logical topology. Now folks, besides the data link layer being referred to as layer 2, or the switching layer in some cases, it's also often referred to as the data link control layer, or DLC layer for short. If you're wondering why it's sometimes called the switching layer, this is because switches work at layer 2, and they make the forwarding decisions based on the layer 2 addresses, which is your MAC address we mentioned earlier. Now, as for why it's sometimes also called the DLC layer, this is because there will be sometimes be a bunch of protocols on this layer which will run as DLC protocols. This includes things like the MAC addresses, which we meant earlier again, once again. 
Now for interest sake, some of the devices you'll find that operate at layer two is devices like your network interface cards or NIC for short, a bridge, a switch obviously, which we mentioned already, and then obviously things like wireless access points or AP for short. Now let's move up one layer in the OSI model to layer three being the network layer. This layer is sometimes referred to as the routing layer because this is the layer associated with IP addresses. So layer two was associated mostly with MAC addresses. Layer three, being this one, is mostly associated with IP addresses. You can probably already guess that routers work at layer three since, well, it's kind of in the name, isn't it? So just like switches operate in layer two and they make the forwarding decisions based on layer two addresses being MAC addresses, routers operate in layer three and they make their forwarding decisions based on layer three addresses, which is now the IP addresses. You'll find that IP addresses are extremely common in just about any network you can find. And any device that makes a forwarding decision based on something like an IP address is probably most likely a layer three device. The network layer is responsible for moving data around a network of networks known as an internetwork or well, the internet. Well, the data link layer is capable of forwarding data by using hardware addresses within a single segment. The network layer moves information around an internet work by using a logical network and host IDs. The network layer forwards information between networks by examining the destination, network layer address or logical network address. In other words, IP address in most cases. The packet is forwarded router by router or, well, hop by hop, as some might say, through the internet work or internet to the target network. Once it has reached the destination network, the hardware address, being the MAC address, can then be used to deliver the packet to the target node. Now, moving up the OSI model ladder to layer 4, this is known as the transport layer. The first three layers of the OSI model are primarily concerned with moving frames and datagrams between nodes and networks. At the transport layer, however, which is also known as the end-to-end -end or host-to-host -host layer, the contents of the packets become significant. Any given host on a network will be communicating with many other hosts using many different types of networking data. One of the functions of the transport layer is to identify each type of network application by assigning it a port number. For example, data requested from an HTTP web application can be identified as port 80. Now, this transport layer can also be called the post office layer, since this is the layer that describes how data is delivered and where it's being delivered. The protocols we use in this layer is protocols such as TCP, which stands for Transmission Control Protocol, and also UDP, which stands for User Datagram Protocol. Now how this all works is, think of a web page that you need to go and load, but this web page is so darn gosh large, that you just can't load it all in one frame. Now what's going to happen in that situation is, it will be split up into separate frames, and then at the destination, being your computer most likely, it will be reconstructed or reassembled back together, giving you the full page or end result at the end of the day. The interesting thing here is, computers don't actually receive the frames in the correct order. This is not something you guys need to know at this point in time, it's just a fun fact. So computers don't actually receive these frames in the correct order, but yet you get the correct end result in the end of the day. That is because with computers, it doesn't actually matter in which order to receive these frames or these packets. As long as they receive all the frames and all the packets, they can effectively go and reconstruct them and give you the correct end result. Now, unfortunately of us human beings, that's a whole different ball game. If we human beings receive something in the wrong order, we just won't be able to comprehend it. That's just going to be a train smash. All right, folks, let's move up further up that OSI model ladder to layer five. This layer is called the session layer. This layer's job is the communication management between devices. It'll do things like start, stop, restart the communication session between one device and another. 
Most application protocols require the exchange of multiple messages between the client and server. This exchange of such a sequence of messages is called a session or dialogue. The session layer represents functions that administer the process of establishing a dialogue, managing data transfer, and then ending or tearing down the session. So in short, the session layer allows users on different machines to establish active communication sessions between them. It is responsible for establishing, maintaining, synchronizing, and terminating sessions between end user applications. This layer basically establishes a connection between the session entities. Now looking at the workings of the session layer, it uses the services provided by the transport layer, enables applications to establish and maintain sessions and to synchronize the sessions. All right, folks, and then moving up to our sixth layer of the OSI model, this layer is known as the presentation layer. This layer is also known as the translator layer, since it basically acts as a translator or converter of sorts. So what this layer does is actually pretty simple. When your machine receives data, it's not going to be in a format that you as a human can understand which is pretty much what I was referring to earlier when I said your PC also won't receive frames in a logical order. What the presentation layer will do is it's going to take that data encoding for what you receive and then just convert it and display it in a format that you or we as humans can actually understand. I suppose in a matter of speaking, it's kind of like a converter or a translator if you think about it, which is one of the reasons why it's probably called the translator layer. The presentation layer can also be conceived as supporting data compression and encryption. So any form of character encryption or application will happen at layer 6. You'll find that the presentation layer is often combined with the application layer because the functionality is so closely associated with our ability to use these applications. The main responsibility of the presentation layer is to provide or define the data format and encryption. All right, everyone, moving on to layer seven of the OSI model. This is known as the application layer. This layer is effectively the layer that we as humans are able to see or that gets presented to us at least. So if you were to go into your browser and open a web page of your choice, what you see there is basically the application layer doing its thing. Everything you see there on the screen is the layer seven application data. Now, some of the application layer protocols could be stuff like if you find yourself using a browser with HTTP or HTTPS, or if you're transferring a file with FTP. You might also find yourself resolving a name with DNS or using email with something like POP3. All of these are actually, believe it or not, application layer protocols. Well, folks, that's pretty much the OSI model summarized into a bite-sized video for you. I hope this video has been informative for you, and if it has been, please give the video a like and let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section down below. If you'd like to receive more free training content like this, also remember to hit that subscribe button down below. Now on a side note, guys, as you're probably well aware, I started my own Patreon for those of you that like to support me so I can create more free training content like this. And I see I actually already have my first Patreon. I barely started making the Patreon account and I already have my first Patreon. So yay me. <laughs> Here is my first Patreon, so special thank you to Todd O'Connor, I see. Alright everyone, see you on the next lesson of CompTIA Network Plus.